This lecture is titled Performative Reading of Cherry Orchard. It is uh, with great pleasure that I share this lecture with you because much of it is by way of reportage of the students work. The lecture for the purpose of clarity is divided into two parts. The first part deals with performance processes and the second part deals with this notion of scene description. Uh, so, it is titled significance of scene descriptions and landscapes in naturalistic classics. Uh, this is an important part of our understanding of drama because often people or uh, new students who are not used to reading plays ignore the scene descriptions. So, we want you to understand that it is a very vital part of the artistic vision of an artist. The performance processes will unfold gradually and in some ways they are very close to the way this activity unfolded in the actual classroom. We indeed would have taken you to our actual, actual classroom, but acoustically the recordings really do not work out very well. So, the best methodology we thought was to bring some of the activities on board here for your own enjoyment and assessment. So, now this particular part emphasizes the experience of the play. That is, in addition to reading of a particular play, I feel that it is important to experience the doing of the play. In order to write plays and to become a playwright, this is again an important part of your understanding. It does wonderful things, it loosens you up, it helps you participate in number of activities with other people. And so, what I have done here is to show the gradual unfolding of the process and this will culminate in the end semester question paper which was given to the students uh, taking care of all these facets that we had discussed earlier in the classroom. So, this will give you also a sense of how none of these activities are considered valueless. They are all assigned a value in a literal sense also within the academic framework. So, the academic framework need not be just a totally verbal framework, but it can also incorporate performative activities. It is a kind of via media between these two that we have tried to work out, mainly because our purpose is to help you write better. So, then experiencing the play, uh, it started with close reading of the selected play and extensive classroom discussion of the content and form. Lots of you know puzzle responses came. Uh, often the students did not have background in reading plays and even those who had background in reading plays really quite genuinely found Chekhov quite mystifying and that those were very, very interesting discussions. Then what we decided is to read the play within the writer's historical context. I know that academically this is sometimes challenged, this historical contextualization is challenged, but personally I value that greatly because it also helps you extend yourself not only in terms of the otherness of the characters, but otherness of other cultures, historical periods and so on. We also try to check out as to the sort of performative readings of the play in India. Whatever information we had, we shared it with each other. And then finally, it led to a performance by the elective students after uh, another round of discussions about how to flesh out the performative aspect, how to flesh out the content in terms of performative details. And they had lots of rehearsals and I judiciously kept out of it so that they could have lot more fun rehearsing. But from time to time I also was there to ensure that we were on the same page. Finally, this activity led to creative reinterpretations. And again we will give you a sample because often it is really not an imitative mode that we want to you know highlight or emphasize. In fact, 
we never want that to happen in creative writing. We are sharply aware of the fact that each writer has to find his or her creative direction. So, from that point of view, uh, some activities were generated which were spurred by the reading of Cherry Orchard. So, as I said, there were lots of these conversations uh, amongst us uh, in class and online through the IIT system of Moodle that is made available to us. And then the students decided voluntarily on the different characters they wanted to read and perform. And after that, I realized that there were still students who had not really taken any role because they were already exhausted. And so, the best thing was to actually choose their role as an audience, an imagined audience in Chekhov's Russia. And so, then uh, I conjured up these ideas here and I thought that you know they could add their own uh, interpretations. So, uh, one of them could be the Indian freedom fighter visiting Russia of Chekhov's time. Um, or a person of Anya's age, uh, that is very young person, or Chekhov himself watching the performance, or a Marxist thinker, again watching this play and analyzing it, or any other possibility that they wish to explore within the historical framework of Chekhov. So, that was the key guiding principle, the historical framework. So, you could speculate and you could play around with that historical framework. The performance was coordinated very ably by Renal Cheda. They, the students went around searching for locations for performance and then we realized that if we do that, the quality of the recording may not be up to the mark and so, we decided to settle on the studio space, but at the same time, there was a sense of design space, spa, uh, place and whatever relevant details that they could work out, music, rehearsal all of these were coordinated by renal, but everybody participated very actively. What it did was to break their isolation, because I found many of them were very, very quiet and it happens many times that some of the more articulate or some of the more enthusiastic students, they speak uh, a great deal and the others become really very silent spectators. So, I think with this kind of activity, we were able to break that isolation. There is a lot of wonderful new kind of energy that developed. And also, I think they realized that there is a lot of art and craft involved in interpreting a character for performance and uh, therefore, all these specific uh, uh, you know specific aspects of interpretation they try to work out. But they what they have done finally is to read and perform simultaneously. So, this is really not like a professional performance, it is still performance which is uh, which does take care of the transformation that occurs when a person or an actor plays a character, but at the same time this is not a complete uh, performance, it is a reading come performance, which was useful for the classroom uh, purpose and also they did not really have the kind of time which requires a fully fleshed out performance. They are perfectly capable of it, but we did not have that kind of time during the pace of the semester. Now, very quickly I would just point out that the cherry orchard as we have already noted. I think again the question of plot is very important. We do realize that in terms of the cherry orchard, the plot structure does partially reveal the economic and psychological dimensions of each character. One can say that it is almost in some ways deterministic, but not fully really. And that is where the Chekhovian world view comes in. But so, par partly like other realistic and naturalistic plays, there are causal elements in the play which also are very important. At the same time, what stands out is this comic come tragic aspects of each character's lack of fulfilled dialogue. 
and this is all this is something that cannot be explained fully only through the causality of the plot structure. So, due to various uh, varying economic situations, but at the same time the pervasiveness of this deep sense of loneliness that you experience through this play and through the characters in this play, there is a kind of choral quality in Jacobian drama leading to this feeling that there is a world view or defined world view that one can assess, but I will not go into that right now, because I think basically multiple interpretations are possible and indeed that is what the students have done in all their work. I thought that at this point in time, because we are talking about performing the play, it is important to bring in Stanislavski, who actually worked very closely with Anton Chekhov and developed the method acting ideas, but mainly uh, I have relied on Stanislavski's own writing on Chekhov in general. His notion of the subtext of course, Stanislavski's notion of the subtext uh, points out that if the text is created by the playwright, then the subtext that is the implied meaning of every action, the implied internal meaning of the action of the characters or actors is, uh, is supplied by the actors. So, there is this whole world of interpretation that they bring in, they animate this inner world. So, I think what you can perhaps do is to think of the subtext in terms of also the fact that the reason it needs this kind of interpretation, very careful uh, uh, deep interpretation is because very often you find in Chekhov that the external view of the character does not match up with the internal self view of the character. Sometimes they are not even uh, in touch with that internal self view, they are vaguely aware of it. So, it is this trajectory that is brought out through the notion of the subtext. And then uh, I thought you know it would be really wonderful to uh, remember that Stanislavski directed the first production of Cherry Orchard. And Chekhov and Stanislavski had great deal of disagreement on the interpretation. However, there are these eloquent statements that Stanislavski has made about the cherry orchard, where he said that well it is almost like a bud. Uh, I am not reading the full uh, quotation, but he says that uh, you know it was difficult getting everything right in the production, uh, because it is a very difficult play. Its attraction lies in its elusive, deeply buried fragrance. To smell it, you have to open the bud, as it were, and make it flower. But this must happen of its own accord, without force. Otherwise, you will crush the fragile bloom and it will die. So, he is aware of the complexity and demands, and he loved Jacobian writing and the provocations that it provided at that point in time. The disagreement between Stanislavski and Chekhov as I have listed here, that actually revolved round the notion of the comic and the tragic. Chekhov felt and he clearly stated this in the title, subtitle of the play, he called Cherry Orchard a comedy. Whereas, Stanislavski in his interpretation emphasized the tragic. So, I have just posed a few questions for you to think about. As I said, multiple interpretations are possible. So, you know, you can have your own take, because I think it is important for you to have your own position on this. So, now, so some of the queries are placed before you. Does Chekhov hint? among all the different views of life expressed in the play, what his own viewpoint might be. How does Chekhov create irony? So, the surface shows something else and the implied meaning is entirely different. That is what irony is all about. So, how does Chekhov create irony? Also, you can have a look at the manner in which uh, Chekhov uses 
juxtaposition and contrast, you know, contrasting elements, characters. The other question relates to Chekhov's comedy being tinged with a sense of absurdity and spiritual vacuum. The term absurdity, as you remember, we had discussed it with reference to Albert Camus and his philosophy of the absurd. The term has philosophical bearing and therefore, it does reflect a state of being which has great deal of value in terms of its continuity and its content. So, have a look at the term absurdity uh, even in Chekhov a bit carefully, because Chekhov in some ways allows you to discuss realism, naturalism uh, and at the same time it almost brings the you know possibilities of this form to its extreme, almost leading on to the non-realistic representational modes. So, have a careful look, it will allow you to understand many other uh, movements and canonize texts much, much better. There is a lot of discussion about why Cheka was not really very, very political in his outlook, although he actually wrote amidst revolutionary ferment. There was such a lot of talk about change and fundamental change in Russian society at that time. He himself came from very, very deprived background. So, there is always been this question about the revolutionary period and Chekhov and I just will place Stanislavski's point of view here, which I think uh, I do relate to. He says that in his appeals to build a new life, Chekhov often uses the rule of contraries. He says that here is a fine chap and there is another one and a third, all nice people leading a good life and their shortcomings are charming and amusing. But taken all in all, everything is tedious, useless, irritating and moribund. What is to be done? we must join forces and change everything, strive for a different and better life. That is what Stanislavski felt and if you look at Trofimov, in some ways this is the voice that you hear. So, then uh, what we will do here at this point is to place not Trofimov, because we have already shared various interpretations of Trofimov very, very interesting interpretations of Trofimov, but now we would place a reading of Yepichodov undertaken by the students. So, in terms of the contrasting characters is Trofimov and Yepichodov. Yepichodov who is comic through and through and therefore, the tragic element surfaces from time to time in a very different combination, whereas Trofimov seems like a tragic figure fighting against various odds and actually turns out to be somewhat comic also. So, now let us have this uh, presentation of Yepichodov and also the translation of Yepichodov in the student's mother tongue. Hi, I am Venkatesh D. I played the character of Yepichodov in the play Cherry Orchard. I found the play funny and amazing. I would like to take the pleasure of extending this joy through the translation of some of Epikodo's dialogues into my mother tongue Telugu. Epikodo Vedika Medhiki Raga ne atani chetulo anchi pool ikkrinda jari padi pothai. Atadu a pool ani paiki tis kuntu. Idi totamali daggar nunchi. Atanu idi bojanala gadilo ki pampa mani cheppadu. Dunya shake isto. ఈ ఉదయం మంచుతో కప్పుకుంది 3 డిగ్రీలు తక్కువ కానీ చెర్రి మొక్కలు అంతా ములకెత్తాయి నేను మన వాతావరణం గురించి ఎక్కువ ఆలోచిస్తానని చెప్పలేను మన వాతావరణం సహకరించేంత అనుకూలంగా లేదు నేను రెండు రోజుల క్రితమే ఒక జత బూట్లు కొనుక్కున్నాను అవి భరించలేనంత శబ్దాన్ని చేస్తున్నాయని మీ సమ్మతితో తెలియజేయాలనుకుంటున్నాను వాటికి ఏమి పూయాలి 
ప్రతిరోజు నాకు ఏదో ఒక అనుకోని సంఘటన ఎదురవుతోంది కానీ దాని గురించి నేను ఆలోచించను నేను నవ్వుతూ ఉండడం అలవాటు ప చేసుకున్నాను సరే నేను వెళ్ళాలి అతను వెళ్తూ వెళ్తూ కుర్చీని తట్టుతాడు అది క్రింద పడిపోతుంది చూడండి అనుకోకుండా జరిగిన ఈ సంఘటన దీనికి ఉదాహరణగా చెప్పచ్చు అతడు బయటకు వెళ్ళిపోతాడు గిటారు వాయిస్తూ మరియు పాడుతూ ఈ గోల ప్రపంచం నాకేంటి ఓ మిత్రులు శత్రువులు నాకేంటి ఇలా మాండోలిన్ వాయించడం ఎంత హాయిగా ఉంటుంది ప్రేమతో పిచ్చివాడైన వాడికి ఇది మాండోలిన్ ఓ ఆ నా మనసు పులకరించింది తిరిగి పొందిన ప్రేమ వేడితో ద నెక్స్ట్ కాంట్రాస్టింగ్ క్యారెక్టర్ దట్ ఐ వాంట్ టు ప్లేస్ బిఫోర్ యూ ఈజ్ యాషా అండ్ ఫియర్స్ యాషా ఇఫ్ యూ రిమెంబర్ is a new age helper is uh, shown to be cunning and dehumanized fears on the other hand is an old world helper and i use the word helper because i really don't like the word servant at all uh, and again he is dedicated and still dehumanized so both are dehumanized characters one of the students decided to be an audience audience member of fears vintage and this is the write up he wrote as an audience member after looking at the performance of selected parts of cherry orchard by his fellow students and i'm reading his response the student's name is aditya dachalwal and he was an audience member of fears vintage being an old person i have seen a lot in my life and now have reached a stage where i don't want any more changes or surprises i just want a stagnant life which i know which i understand in short i resist any form of movement and lead a completely sedentary lifestyle fears is perfect example for my case even though he has been a slave for his entire life yet he doesn't regret it at all not as he want to be free he is okay with foregoing the freedom that he rightly deserves in this way he is completely opposite to trofimov who always talks about liberation fears represents the mentality of an ancient serf who has known this life and this life only and is averse to change it could even be said that he is institutionalized unable to adapt with rapidly changing with the rapidly changing social system around him but near the end of the play when fear says that his life went on as if he had never lived at all this touched my heart and aroused in me the need to do something in my old age i am also averse to change since familiarity however distressing is always preferable over an uncertain future especially for an old man like me steeped in custom and habits but fears makes me realize if you get stubborn and don't change with the times the present will forget you and leave you behind you will end up just a relic of the past gone by it's never too late for a change and i don't want my life to end up like fears so as i pointed out to you all these uh, intricate activities which uh, unfolded over a semester's time frame uh, they led to the end semester examination so i'm not giving you the full uh, question paper although when i look at the answer books some of them really uh, prompt me to place the full examination question paper and all the answers before you because they are really very very interesting fascinating and creative but i will resist that temptation uh, part of this exam paper is placed before you so let's have a look at it it's titled 
doing, being, writing. And the question revolves around Chekhov's cherry orchard and I am reading directly from that question paper as it was verbatim. Chekhov's cherry orchard is often used as a text in creative writing courses. Respond to the given ideas, perspectives that the text generates. It gives a detailed sense of the struggles of the characters within a historical period. To respond to this standpoint, identify the historical period of the play, name all the characters and the nature of each character's struggle. The state of mind of the characters is conveyed by a combination of action that is physical activity, conversation and subtext. Flesh out these aspects through any situation or character of your choice to substanti substantiate this standpoint. In reading this modern classic, the scene descriptions add to the reader's understanding of how nature or landscape forms an integral yet separate part of the play, taking cues from realism, naturalism of Chekhov write a short evocative literary piece with the following considerations in mind. And this is the part that right now I would like you to focus on because all of our activities finally lead to independent creative writing that is their aim. Uh, and on the other hand we do want our students to become very good readers because that is also very important for becoming good writers to understand the craft, the milestones, the possibilities. Uh, but at the same time eventually it is their own creative work which we value the most. So uh, do pay attention to this question from that point of view because within this I have given a couple of guidelines. So what are these guidelines? Let us have a look at them. Decide the genre, state of mind of the character or characters, locale, plot, point of view. Maintain the com complexity of the human nature interface. Keep the creative attempt brief, one or two pages only. Follow the oft repeated guideline of creative writing courses, show, do not tell. Doing or performing the play draws out the students. This is again it goes on in another direction, but just keep that particular point in mind. I will read the rest of it also. Uh, doing or performing the play draws out the students through physical as well as imaginative action. Respond to the given outcomes by spelling out your own opinions as lucidly as possible. Again this is kind of interesting and important from my perspective uh, because I, I do feel that drama is not taught uh, in the way it should be taught in our classrooms. Uh, it does many, many interesting things apart from of course exposing students to a great art form. And so I have taken into consideration the fact that many of the students were doing these activities for the first time. So then doing or performing of the play is the focus of this part of the question. And again their opinions on the following ideas were sought. Uh, physical action. So, out of this there were three ideas that were placed for their own uh, choice and further elaboration. It energizes the performer, breaks his or her passivity, turns creativity discussion from purely self-directed concerns to cooperative creative activity. B. Imaginative action. One learns to imagine what it means to be the other. Selection of symbolic gestures, words, backdrop enhance the understanding of creative representation of reality through writing, performing. And so now I would place before you two examples or two samples of the end semester question paper where the students responded to the human relationship with nature or landscape. Uh, you have already actually been introduced to these students. Uh, Arvind Singh wrote a piece called Six Feet Under and that is the piece I am reading first and then I will read Renal's write up. 
So, without any comment, this is the creative piece he wrote. I am Rizwan or rather it would be more appropriate for me to say I was Rizwan. You see, I am dead. How did I die, you ask? Well, I died by the most depraved, indecent way known to humanity. Gastric juices ate away my stomach, my organs one by one shut down. I died a slow, painful death. Yes, I died of hunger. It was the third year of the drought. The sun beat upon the ugly, cracked up earth and roasted its soul. The seeds we had planted had long since withered, burnt for the want of water. The food supply we had long since exhausted. Now I fed my kids boiled grass and roots. They threw up violently at night, thrashing with stomach cramps. And I watched them each night, helpless, until one day they stopped moving. Just lay on their stomachs, the lights in their eyes exhausted. Nights were intolerable. Out of every house came the sound of waiting and death. The village was a graveyard and we were all walking dead. They came again yesterday, guards of the money lender, asking me for my pound of flesh. What's left for you to take? Every piece of clothing and even the last vessel you took months ago. What do you want now? You still have your land. Sell it to us and be free. My land? No. It's been there for generations of my family. I'm nothing if not a farmer. I won't sell my land. I would rather die. Then so be it. You might wonder why is this man willing to die rather than let go of his land? Why doesn't he move away? He lets his wife and children die. What sort of a monster is this man? You wouldn't understand. Only a man who has loved his land like a wife, cared for it like a child would. My land is my identity, the only thing left to me by my forefathers. I am my land and I won't let go. This shall be my last victory over the world. I didn't bend, I rather broke apart. The burning in my stomach is a dull ache now, familiar, almost pleasing. I have nary a strength left in me. I just watch myself wither away. I just hope they let me have my six feet of my own land to rest in peace. I hope. The second piece is by Renal and it's very different in feel. Interestingly, both the students spoke from the position of the underdog. It was nearing sunset. The sky seemed painted with a shade of colors, red, peach, pink and purple, all melting into one another. She bid him farewell as he boarded a ship. He would come back soon, he had said. She stood there till the ship seemed like a tiny speck on the horizon. The light was fading and it was dark by the time she returned home. He had promised to get her a bag just like Rani, their neighbor, had. And in return, she had promised to go to school daily. She lived in a small chawl in a shabby room that served as a bedroom, a living room and a kitchen all in one. She would cook twice a day trying to save as much money as he had her, as he had left her. She would sneak into the local school some day and sit unnoticed in a corner. She could not afford the fees. She would sit by the window sometimes, hoping that he would return soon. Sometimes she would go to the sea. At night she would lie awake, staring at the black wall and at the impressions of the suit on it. Days turned into weeks until she finally decided to go in search of her father. She went to the sea and asked everyone if they knew anything about him. Her search was fruitless and she had lost all hope. 
She then met a group of men who told her she must cross the sea and she would find a purpose to live. Her father had warned her of the sea and its treacherous waves. She did not know what to do. But I have to find a reason to live, she thought to herself. I need money to go on. The sun was shining bright above, casting its shadow ahead of her. I'm sorry. The sun was shining bright above, casting her shadow ahead of her. She decided to take a boat across. She thought she had no other way out. She took a last look at the town she had spent her childhood in. The boat had reached the middle of the sea. She could hear a distant bell. She was far away and there was no coming back.